little bit of an indulgence on this Tuesday morning. I could make the case that he is Australia's best modern day actor. Think Jack Irish. We love Jack Irish with all our hearts here. Big screen, fair, memento. Part of the Marvel Universe my son discovered not that long ago. He has a habit in of bobbing up in the best TV of the year. Think about Mayor of Easttown last year. And I think we can all agree that he won the Neighbours finale. If there was anything we could take away from the Neighbours finale, it was that Guy Pearce won by about six goals. Guy <laughs> Pearce, it's great to have you in the studio. Welcome. Thank you, Jared. What an introduction. A real <laughs> honour to be here. And I think we did win the uh, the Neighbours. Annie and I probably won the Neighbours finale together. It was it a was combined nice. effort. Was it nice to be here when it played to just get the the reaction to it? Absolutely. It was a real honour. I mean, it, and it was all very. It was sort of sad, obviously, knowing that the show was finishing, but but to finally have the opportunity to come back for a decent reason uh, felt really good. And obviously to see it play. And Annie texted me that night that I, that, I, that it played and she said, I think we've broken the internet. So, so yeah, it was great to be part of it, sort of a real full circle. What, what, what does it mean to you knowing that that's, that's sort of the launching off point? Well, I, I, I hadn't realised so much how people were hanging on for years and years to this idea that Mike and Jane could have, <laughs> could have, would have, should have, yeah. you know. And so as soon as it seemed like I was going back on the show, that was the thing that not only the public but also the, the producers were saying, oh, this is, you know. Oh, and I, I sort of felt for all the current cast who were like, well, w hang on, what about us? You yeah. know? So it, it, it was really meaningful, obviously, because it was my first job out of school back in 1985. Uh, the show has meant a great deal to me anyway. And so to be able to sort of come back and, and, and delve back into that world. I had a bit of an existential crisis about how to play Mike again. Yes. <laughs> for all these years. <laughs> like, who is he now? Uh, go back and watch old tapes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't want to do that. That was, that was going to be depressing. What has you in Melbourne at the moment? Uh, well, it was a combination. It was a, it was a family holiday. So Carice and Monty were out here with me as well. I was teaching Monty how to do drop punts and uh, the give and go. <laughs> so there was a lot of that. We Very went down nice. to the Cats and um, got to see a lot of football, which was great. Uh, and, and it turned into then the opportunity to do Neighbours. But also I'm currently here doing The Clearing, which is a mini series about that uh, Anne Hamilton Byrne uh, odd cult that existed back in the sort of 70s and 80s. So I'm busily doing that and then I'll be heading off, sadly, to miss the grand final. I'll be heading off to New Zealand in a couple of weeks. Your timing's not, not quite right, It's not right, great, is it? no, but uh, maybe I'll talk to Lee Tomahori and see if he'll give me a weekend off to come back. Yes, yeah, that, that's... But fingers crossed, you know, yeah, that's yeah, right, yeah, fingers crossed, let's see. It's let's presuming see. a little bit, but we have to be optimistic. That's right, that's right. So it, when you're in the final stages of, of a shoot that you're working at the moment, what's... How does it unfold? How how far in are you in, in terms of it occupying your mind in every waking moment? It's pretty consuming. I mean, it's also difficult because I, as I say, I'm about to go to New Zealand and start another job. So I've got to get the, the you know, the, um, the those sort of muscles working as well. Uh, it, 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 it depends usually how much dialogue I have as to, as to what sort of tricky balance it becomes and how consuming it is. And I've got quite a bit in, the, in this show. The character I play is quite the intellectual, so um, he's far smarter than I am. So I've got a lot of dialogue to learn. It, but it's, it's consuming, but I'm a lot better these days at sort of managing my personal life and working at the same time. In the old days, I really just shut everything out for six yep. or eight weeks and I couldn't even talk to anyone. I, I really, you know, I was anxious about that sort of stuff. But now I'm much better at managing it at the ripe old age of 54. Do you enjoy it? Yeah, I love it. I mean, yeah. I, and, and particularly in, on something like this where I'm working with people I've worked with before who I adore, you know, Miranda Otto and Matt Cameron who's written it and Jeff Walker directing, of course. So, you know, and, and, to, and still as an actor to find those moments uh, where you play and, and you, you go back to being a child and using your imagination and essentially just pretend to be somebody else. If you feel like you're landing that stuff, it's, it's just endlessly exciting. You know, it doesn't always feel like it works, but but when when you find that the artistry of that, you know, that's uh, it just never goes away. The the joy of that. How many projects would you read a year, and how many projects would you take on a year? Uh, oh, that's a good question. I mean, <clears throat> I haven't read as many in the last couple of years since having Monty. I've been a bit consumed with my young child who yep. turned six yesterday, uh, but I probably read ten to. 20 things a year, I suppose. Uh, I take on two, three, four. It depends. I mean, if I, I did a thing called um, 
a Spy Among Friends, uh, which is a, a, a mini series as well in the UK, which took from September last year through till the end of February this year. So that was a beast of a thing. So I'm not doing a lot of those in a row, uh, but if I pop into something for two or three weeks and then I'm out again, then you can, you know, you might be able to do five or six. It's, it just depends. And obviously now I'm trying to manage my time better because of Monty, my little boy. I don't want to be away from him for too long. So it kind of depends, you know, two, three, four a year. Are you, are you a good judge or do you get sent good stuff because your hit rate that you bob up in the best stuff. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I think I'm a pretty good judge. I can read something straight away. I mean, even if it's, I, I've mis, misjudged things before, or I've done things that have have just haven't worked as well as I'd imagined they could have. Uh, but but I, I feel like I can sniff out stinkers pretty quickly. Right. You know? yep. or, or and it's not even so much stinkers. It's just things that feel they've been done before, or things that I don't think I can do something interesting with. So and I have to find that real spark. Otherwise I'm, it's a slog. I'm going to work each day and I'm trying to pretend that I'm convincing and I know I'm not going to be. Whereas if I find something like Mayor of East Town, you know, that Kate invited me to come and do, I just think, oh yes, yeah, I, I know what I'm going to do here. Yeah. So if there's that excitement, then, um, then it's okay. I mean, and I, I sort of, I sort of grade everything a little bit between one and five, you know, there is those, those classic things that I've been fortunate enough to be in, as you mentioned, Memento or Priscilla, LA Confidential, things like that. And then there's the ones at the other end of the spectrum, which just a, a real stinkers and you think, okay, I never want anyone to see that. They're, <laughs> they're always the ones that my friends say, oh, I watched you on the TV the other night in something. How come you did that movie? I'm like, yeah. Um, and then there's a sort of a chunk in the middle, sort of two, three, and four, where they kind of work, but they're not that exciting. People get something out of them. They didn't necessarily have a, a popular life as a film or a TV show, but, you know, they're okay. So so it's interesting trying to figure out what's going to work and what's not going to work. The evolution of the viewing experience has been television productions have become movie quality. And obviously, mm. Netflix is the key driver, and then it spins off in a lot of directions. What's that been like to live through as, as an actor? Well, I feel vindicated in a way because as an actor back in the 80s doing television where people scoffed at you because, you know, there you were doing a soap. Uh, you know, it's quite interesting now. Those actors who never would have done television in the past, yep. of course, are popping up in everything. And it's it's wonderful for a number of reasons. One, because you can usually get a bit of a longer job. Two, because the longer job means that characters are fleshed out more, uh, storylines are uh, more detailed. There's more, yeah, there's just more complexity and that, that can be stretched out over, over six or eight episodes versus an hour and a half's movie. I still love film. I'm old fashioned and I love the idea of going to the cinema and going, wow, there's an hour and a half or two hours of something, you know, spectacular. Even if that something spectacular is small and intimate and emotional and it's a drama and it doesn't have to be a, a Marvel type thing. There is something about seeing something on the big screen. And I must admit with all the television, people, Everyone's talking about all the great TV shows that are going around. I don't watch any of them. <laughs> I just I watch footy and I don't really have enough time to sort of do that. But I don't know how people have the time to watch it all, you know. Hey, I'm on the fourth season of this and yes. the third season of that. I'm like, when are you doing this? You know. Like I guess they're all lying in bed at night sort of <laughs> for hours watching episode after episode. So are you likely to sneak along to a cinema from time to time and um, and take yeah, something in? Well, yes, although having said that, uh, I haven't been to the cinema for quite some time either. I mean, we did take Monty to see um, uh, Buzz Lightly, Lightly, but clearly he was too young for it and he got quite disturbed and we left early. <laughs> right, so, right. I'm so sorry. So I've, I've lost my I've, – maybe I've got a good ability to choose films to be in, but maybe not a good ability to choose films to watch with my child <laughs> yet. <laughs> I think it was really for a 10-year-old. <laughs> what is Jack Irish – mean to you guy it means a lot to a lot of us in melbourne it, it such a lovely tone of the city i thought the racing stuff was brilliant as mm. a racing man we all loved the fitzroy nostalgia in it yeah i had the privilege of writing a, a forward for a, a fitzroy book and reference that the, the most <clears throat> tangible living nostalgic piece of Fitzroy now is in those Jack Irish yes. shows. Well, all that you mentioned, I mean, all of it was just wonderful. As soon as they came to me with it, you know, all those years ago, back in 2011, and I hadn't read them before. Funnily enough, one of my lasting memories is a very close friend of mine uh, uh, who said to me when he heard I was doing Jack Irish, he was a big fan of Peter Temple's books. He said, you are not Jack Irish. <laughs> This is, this is a disgrace. <laughs> it should be Jack Thompson. Why is it you? So I, 
so I had to sort of deal with that a little bit as well, and and, and slowly uh, I, I acquired the um, you know the the appraisal, the positive appraisal from um, Peter himself. So you know he was he, Jack in the books is probably a little more curmudgeonly than than perhaps I am, but but the tone of it, as you say, the the you know the the somewhat sort of lacklustre enthusiasm of Jackson and, <laughs> and that sort of constant, you know, question of going, how did I get myself into this situation? I just thought the tone that Andrew Knight and Matt Cameron created, you know, was really wonderful. It was great stuff to play. As you say, all those references to Melbourne, to, to, to Fitzroy. And I have, you know, as a, as a Cats fan growing up, you know, diehard footy fan back in the eighties, you know, and I was a big fan of Fitzroy too. So so I got it all. I really enjoyed it. And, and it's sad that it's over, but we, we just knew that we'd come to the end and it was you know, time to sort of put it to bed. How do you mark the end when the, it's not the viewing, it's the shooting, I imagine, when you let him go? Well, yeah, we, you, know, the, you have a party and you, <laughs> you drink too much and all that. But I think, I think there's just a great respect between Andrew, Matt, Andrew Anastasius, Ian Colley, our producer, myself, you know, and all the cast who have been on the show, Shane Jacobson, obviously, and, and Marta Dusseldorp. We really, we know that we were on something special, you know, and I, and you just don't take it for granted. And, you know, I mean, I'd like to think that maybe one day there's some sort of, you know, coming back into Jack's world. Yeah. Yeah. It would be when fun. I am older and more curmudgeonly and more appropriate <laughs> to play the role. <laughs> what about the foray into the, the Marvel universe? That was a that was a pretty interesting one. Yeah. Uh, back in 2012, obviously, as uh, as people know, I did Iron Man 3. Um and w what was quite funny about that was I spent six months on that film. Robert Downey broke his ankle in the middle of it, so it, 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 it got dra drawn out. And it was a monster of a, of a film. It was just enormous. And there were big trailers and lots of important people with clipboards everywhere and, you know, money all over the place. And then I went from that to this tiny little independent film down in New Orleans where we all shared a trailer. And so I really was reminded of the, the differences in the industry. It was fantastic because Robert Downey Jr., is fantastic. He was wonderful to work with and really a great spirit to be around, a really wonderful mind, uh, a great, I mean, he is the reason why those films are as successful as they are. And not, not to take anything away from, from the Marvel team, they obviously do a, a, an incredible job, but he brought something, I think, to that role and those scripts that just elevated it. And to be around that and to watch that was, was very exciting and to be part of it. And he was a fan of mine, you know, which was sort of weird, but great and ego boosting and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> but, but it was great fun. I mean, it was a funny job because I, as I say, it was, went for about six months. I worked like a day every two weeks. So I just spent every, you know, those other 10 days when I wasn't working sort of at the gym and jogging and staying really fit and trying not to buy more guitars. <laughs> <laughs> is, is there pressure associated with those that's different to the small one trailer shoot when they, I mean, I don't, there's I, so much money at stake? Well, there's probably pressure, but not pressure that I necessarily see. I think that all happens behind the scenes. As far as I'm concerned, whether whether I'm in a low budget thing or a bigger budget thing, uh, my job and the pressure I put on myself to perform well is the same. Once camera's rolling, I need to be convincing. Simple as that. As Tom Hardy puts it, there's two kinds of actors, convincing and non-convincing. That's all there is to it. Yep. So, but I think... It, one of the things that's perhaps more difficult on those bigger films is just trying to get through to the who's really in charge. Decisions get made, scripts get changed, you know, massive things get changed and they just happen and you are told that that's what's happening. And, and I sort of put my hand up and go, but, but, but hang on, I, I've got it. It's too late. Whereas yes. on a smaller thing, I think on a smaller thing also, you know, directors and producers feel lucky that they've got you. So they come to you and go, hey, we were thinking of this. What do you think? You know, you're sort of more involved in the creative process. But that's okay. You know, that's okay. Was there a Killian action figure? There was a sort of a Lego one. Okay. Yeah, a Lego one where you could turn his you could turn his head and he had a red burning face on one side and the sort of suave, <laughs> you know, classy face on the other side. So there was no real sort of action figure like like Caresis had with Game of Thrones, but uh, but I was pretty happy to be a piece of Lego. <laughs> Good stuff. Yeah. Have you? When's the last time you would have seen Memento? Um, well, I don't know. We well, they had a screening of it. I mean, years ago now they had a screening of it, a ten year anniversary at the New York Film Festival, which yep. we all went to and watched. But I have seen it, it, there was something of it on TV, and I did. I sort of watched like the second half or something. I put together a show reel for myself for work. So I had to watch 
some of it and choose some scenes from it. So I've seen staggered bits of it over the last 10 years, but probably watching it fully in a cinema was that New York screening in 2010 because that was the 10-year anniversary. And what was funny about that was the the people who were watching the film with us, and we did a Q&A afterwards, people putting their hands up going, 10 years, I've wanted to know the answer. <laughs> please, <laughs> please tell us. <laughs> so these sort of poor diehard fans. And I said, look, we sat there at the, at the, at the um, was it the Berlin Film Festival? No, where was it? It was at Cannes or Deville when we first sort of released the film, me, Chris Nolan, Jonah, who wrote the original story, the Todd sisters, the producers, you know, Kate, my wife at the time, sitting around having a dinner, about to go off to the screening. And, and, and we were arguing about what happened in the film. Yes. I thought, well, if we can't agree, then no one has a chance. But the beautiful thing, obviously, about that film is that Chris presents that film in such a way that it's so engaging and you, you're, you're so sucked into it that you can't, it, 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 what's confusing about it doesn't alienate you. So it's really a genius piece of filmmaking and, it, and incredible to be part of. It really is. So <laughs> I guess the the heart of the question was, d does that, does it live with you? Does to be, I don't know, well, clearly it, it, it lives in the back of the mind somewhere and that yeah. it means a lot to a lot of people and there is a curiosity about it. There aren't, the, the the great films do that, and then the whole lot just wash over. They're great fun to watch, and you well, and that's why beat. I ended up sort of creating that one to five list for myself because yeah. I go, wow, these are the ones people are still talking about. You know, the Priscillas of the world or Memento. And interestingly, with Memento, uh, it, it's a real film student film. So I get lots of people write to me saying, we're studying at Berkeley Film. You know, we're we're dissecting Memento. Yes, yeah. Can you please write to us and tell us da 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 da? You know, so I often get that stuff. I mean, you know, ironically, I can't remember a lot of the details yeah. about it because it was, we shot it in 99, you know, it yeah. was a long time ago. Um, I feel I need to keep watching it in order to keep up with everybody else. But it does mean a lot. It, just the opportunity to have done that, you know, or to have been given that opportunity means a lot. I, I, I constantly feel like I'm pinching myself and I'm very lucky to have had the opportunities that I've had. I know I'm not the greatest actor in the world. I, I feel super lucky to still be kind of going and choosing interesting roles, etc. I never take any of it for granted and I'm always really grateful. And something like that, I go, wow, thank you, you know. Yeah. Well, one day one of those students will send you a PhD and you'll read it and go, oh, that's, that's it. That's what it's that, about. They found yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. There's a heap of people asking about roles and movies. Everyone's got their favourite, which is very reassuring. But what I wanted to know is for, you're a footy fan at mm, heart, mm, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I used to. We had a family friend who took me to Cats games when I was a little kid and I would watch the Nan Curvis brothers and, and you know, Rod Blake and these guys and and there was a couple of times when I was a little kid where our family friend got me down into the rooms and I just couldn't believe how godlike these players were. I mean, even even a few years ago, I went down with my sister and you know I think after the two thousand seven premier premiership, I can't remember which one, and had a photo taken with Milburn and Maddie Scarlett and the, you know they were all towering above above me. So there's something so kind of um, uh, iconic about football and its players and what they do. And clearly what they do is just incredible. I mean, the fitness level, the strength, et cetera. But yes, when that's ingrained in your body as a kid, uh, and also we had Neville, Neville Bruns was one of my grade six teachers at school. Oh, so, wow, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, back in about 1980. So yeah, it was, it, I was well ensconced. Is it a great connector to home? Yeah. Well, also with my sister, you know, I, I have a you know, I, I sort of maintain a membership at the club and and uh, and, and a group of seats there. So I, whenever I can, I go with my sister. So Tracy loves the footy as well. Yeah. So we'll go together. Um, yes, absolutely. And, and you know, I, I'm, I'm like a super fan. You know, sort of contacting Joel and Tom Hawkins and saying, <laughs> hey, I want to come to train. You know, <laughs> like an idiot. You know, but they, you know, they're great. They, they love it. Yeah. Optimistic. The way they're playing, yeah, I think so. I mean, they they seem they seem pos you know positively positive and buoyed and ready to go. And you know, there's no question they look pretty impressive at the moment. Mm -hmm. so, All right, uh, take a couple of questions for us if you would. What was Chris Nolan like to work with? This is from a dedicated Chris Nolan fan, Stefan, on the Gold Coast. He he was fantastic, and the thing that was really uh, evident about Chris was, on some level, he seems intimidating because he's quite the intellectual, quite sort of professorial. 
uh, and he knows everything about cameras and all the technical stuff. But he was really all over the the detail of emotional performance and and you know the subtlety about saying a line this way or that way and what he was getting. You know, so so he was fantastic to communicate with, uh, and really inspiring. I mean, he, you know, he just created that performance really. <laughs> Yeah. Was Guy's moustache in Animal Kingdom real? Yes, it was. <laughs> it was outstanding. I don't think I've ever worn. Have I ever worn a fake moustache? I'm not sure. What do you think about my one at the moment, it's Jared? A, it's it, nice, isn't it's it? It's good growth. It's creepy. I, I, I admire you. <laughs> <laughs> You're aiming for creepy, I take it, in, yeah, this, yeah. in this role. I seriously hope Guy does not rate the Count of Monte Cristo as a stinker. That's Tim in Brunswick, a closet fan of the Count of Monte Cristo. Tim, no, I do not rate it as a stinker. It's a great film. It's a really strong film and, you know, uh, it's got great energy to it and I feel really proud of that one, yeah. And uh, I think I had a bad wig in that though. I think my wig might have been a stinker. <laughs> yeah, if you look closely. Fan of Prometheus coming through? Is that about 10 years ago now? Yeah, 2011 we shot that. Uh, that was... Was that 2011? Yeah, I think so. Is there a movie guy regrets turning down? That's a good question, isn't it? Um, the Matrix was one that I just did not understand when I read it. Uh, I'm very glad that my extremely good friend Hugo Weaving ended up playing the role. Uh, and I wasn't offered it. I should be clear. It wasn't that I was offered it, but they were keen to chat and talk about it. And I went in and had a chat and then I just didn't pursue it because I, I just really didn't get it. And I, I sort of at the time felt I couldn't see past playing Ed Exley in that role. So I just didn't want to. You know, I just didn't want to pursue it. Um, so I don't regret it because I'm really glad it became what it became and Hugo got to do what he got to do. But there is a part of me going, oh, right, now I get it. <laughs> one of my favourite films of all time is The Proposition, one of the most visceral descriptions of Australian colonial history to date. Thank you, Guy, for ma making such a great story. Well, my comment to that would be that is actually my favourite film out of all the films I've done. Uh, obviously, I love Priscilla and, you know, Memento and other great films, you know, um, Death Defying Acts, etc. But there's something about the proposition that it, it just is so evocative and it, it feels like we're in an, inside a Nick Cave song. So it's very moving and really powerful and, yeah, definitely one of my favourites. And there's a few who are just like a little feel for LA Confidential is such a moment in time for obviously for yourself and Russell Crowe's there and it's evocative. Mm -hmm. How do you think back on that time and, um, and I guess what, what it opened up? Well, I, I extremely fondly and, and, and on many levels, you know, even more so than Memento because it was my first American film, Curtis Hanson, you know, speaking of the director creating that performance. That really was a lesson in film acting from Curtis Hansen. Uh, obviously I got to work with Russell finally, who is just incredible as we know. Um, I, I, I just felt like I was during, it's a bit of a blur, I suppose the shoot, because I was, it was my first film, as I say in the States and I was just trying to keep my wits about me. It really wasn't until I saw the film and then I started to appreciate what it was that we'd all been part of. Um, but I was pretty sort of anxious doing it, just not wanting to end up on the cutting room floor, you know. Uh, but yes, it's a classic, absolutely. Yeah. Stolen by the Titanic at the Academy Awards. <laughs> <laughs> Some things will never be put right. That's right. Guy, a huge thank you for taking the time to come in. I know you're busy with the shoot and all. It's uh, great to have a chance to have a chat with you. An absolute pleasure. Thank you, Jared.